Hello. Welcome to White Baby Gardening in Worm Farm. How are you guys doing? So today we are going to be discussing some pests and some diseases that affects amaranth or callaloo as it is called by the Jamaican locals. Right, so, and we're going to be discussing some ways that you can treat these pests in case you end up with any of these issues. So, the first and most likely pest to affect your color plant is what is known as the amaranth stem weevil. Oh, hi, Rodney. Yes, what is known as the amaranth stem weevil, or it is also known as pigweed weevil. Now, what are some of the symptoms that shows that your plant has this pest? The grub or the larvae of the amaranth stem weevil will actually bore into the center of the stem and sometimes into the branches as well. And then the stem become filled with frost. Hi, CC. Yes, so once these larvae bore into the center of the stem of the plant, they will eat the pith of the plant and then they will leave behind the frost. The larvae and the adults of some species of these, because there are several species of them. So the larvae and adults of some of these species may actually spread fungi and this may cause the plants to decay or it may cause cankers to grow on the stem or the branches of the leaves and sometimes on the root color as well. Now, when there are more 20 to 30 larvae in the same stem, it actually weakens the plant and may cause the plants to start twisting. It may start wilting, or sometimes it may cause the plant to split along the length of the stem. Sometimes it will result in the plant being stunted, and sometimes it can lead to the death of the plant. So having these weevil can be detrimental to your plants. Now, what, let's see, Rodney says, something has discolored my leaves causing a yellowing. Okay, your yellowing, does it appear in spots or is it the entire leaf that is just turning yellow? Are there other plants around it that is actually turning yellow or is it just the amaranth plant that is turning yellow? No, sections of the plants, okay. Yeah, and you don't have an issue with aphids, do you? Or any deficiency, nutrients deficiency in the plants? Okay, so the life cycle, let's discuss the life cycle of these weevils. The weevil, they tend to lay single eggs in holes in the stem of the plants. And then after laying the eggs, then the female will secrete a green, some green substance and use that to seal the holes after they have laid their eggs. Okay, so no other plants beside it. No aphids discovered and possibly nutrients deficiency. Usually if it is a nutrient deficiency, unless of course all the amaranth are planted together. Unless all the nutrients, um, sorry, unless all the amaranth are planted together and there are no other plants interplanted with it, then if there are no other plants beside it, 
then the chances are it could be a nutrient deficiency. But if you have interplanted other plants and they're not showing any sign of yellowing, then it may not be a nutrient deficiency unless, of course, maybe the amaranth is a heavier feeder than the other plants that you have interplanted it with. There are many different type of reasons why your leaves could be yellowing. Overwatering can cause it to yellow. Having too much nitrogen in the soil can cause it to yellow. Having too little bit of nitrogen can cause it to turn yellow. Uh, being parched from the sun, if the leaves become too dehydrated and start to die, then they could turn yellow. So there are actually many reasons why the plant could be turning yellow. Let's see. I, I took up cilantro and about a week later planted callaloo. Okay, yeah, so um, after taking up the cilantro, did you add any nutrients to the soil? Hi, Russell. Yes, because sometimes, depending on how much nutrients you had there initially before you planted the cilantro, or depending on how often you fertilize the cilantro, it could have used up the nutrients that is there. So, yes, there's a possibility then. So just um, try adding a bit of nutrients. Um, yellowing usually is associated with a nitrogen deficiency. So try adding some nitrogen and see what happens. Yes, so as I was saying regarding the life cycle of the weevil they like to lay single eggs in the holes in the stem of the plant and then they will seal it with a green secretion now when these eggs hatch the larvae bore through the stem of the plant and they tend to do this in a zigzag pattern and as it feeds on the pith of the plants now this process will actually leave the plant filled with frass as i mentioned before but you might be wondering what frass is it is actually the powdery refuse that is produced by insects that bore into plants. Now, there are many species of this amaranth weevil, or the pigweed, pigweed weevil. The eggs, they usually hatch in as little as six days, and that depends on the temperature. So the warmer the temperature, then within six days it will hatch. If the temperature is not warm enough, then it can take longer than six days. Now, after roughly a month, the larvae will actually pupate and they will pupate at the base of the plant, base of the stem of the plant or at the lowest branches. Now, just before the larvae pupates, it will actually burrow to the surface of the stem and they will leave just a thin layer of the plant, the outside of the stem that they have not born through because this offer protection for them so they wouldn't bore entirely through the plants. They will just leave a thin layer. Now, it pupates for about 13 days if the temperature is somewhere close to 37 degrees Celsius. And then after that, the adult will emerge and then it will start feeding on the leaves of the plant. Now, because some species of callaloo are invasive, a lot of farmers will use these beetles as a form of herbicide because if you're a farmer and amaranth is not what you're farming and you have the invasive types of callaloo, then they will use the weevil as an herbicide to control the population. So as we go further in the discussion, I'm going to be talking more about um, steps that you can take to protect your plants, especially if you have invasive species. Let's see. Hi, Han White. Mm 
Okay, so your color low had fungus on them, but not anymore because you sprayed it with baking soda and it worked. Excellent. So there is another treatment. That's good. Now, how can you actually control these pig weed weevil? Before you actually plant your callaloo or your amaranth, you want to make sure that there aren't any wild callaloo that is actually infected. So if there are any infected wild callaloo, then it is a good idea to get rid of the plants. You want to take it out from the root. So all of the plants you want to get rid of. And don't just put it in your compost or throw it in your garbage. You want to destroy the plant because they can survive in the plant that you have rooted up and then they can spread. And even if you don't see infected invasive species of the amaranth, even if they're not infected, it is a good idea to get rid of the invasive species because one, some of them might be edible, but some of them, even though they're edible, they tend to be hairy, so they don't really taste as good when you're eating them because of those little tiny hairs that are on them. They tend to be coarse, and you don't want them taking over the space where you're growing the ones that you want to be producing, not to mention that if they are invasive, they're going to be taking over. And the more of them you have, the more likely it is that you're going to be exposed to these weevils. So it's a good idea to get rid of the invasive varieties that might be growing around you. Now, while you're growing the amaranth, you want to examine the plant regularly. You want to remove as soon as there is any sign of these weevil infecting your plants then you want to remove it and like i said before you want to destroy the infected plants these creatures feed on the stem of your plants they feed on the leaves of the plant they feed on the roots of your plants depending on what stage they are at so it's a good idea to remove the entire plant once it is infected now, after the crop has been harvested, you want to collect the remains of the plants, including the root, as I mentioned before. Burn or bury it, bury it deeply, and that will help to prevent it from spreading if it is infected. So some of the treatments that you can use for these amaranth weevil is neem oil works pretty well. You can, re you can use pyrethrum, or you can use the artificial version of the pyrethrum, which is pyrethroids. So these are some of the treatments that you can use and has white Davy met, sorry. <laughs> oh Lord, as on white mentioned, um, using baking soda does help with some types of fungus because these pests can cause fungus to start growing on your plants. So the larvae that is inside the plant, it will not be affected by the external treatment that you apply. And so if you want to get the larvae under control, you might have to cut the stem in the region that is damaged and manually remove the larvae and destroy them. Now, when symptoms occur, you want to cut the damaged part of the plants off and remove the eggs and the larvae and destroy them as quickly as possible because it does not really take much for them to spread. So it's a good idea to get treatment as quickly as possible. So what I'm going to be doing, because this is a live discussion, so I don't have any pictures to show you what these type of weaver look like. There are some of them that actually look similar to stink bug. They can be green, they can be brown, 
There are some of them that can be mistaken for potato weevil. They can also be mistaken for the tomato orn weevil. So I'm going to be doing a video on that pretty soon so that you viewers can have an idea of what they look like in case you have never encountered them before. Okay, so let's look at some diseases that may affect the amaranth plant. One such disease is called the anthracnose, and the symptoms include necrotic lesions on the leaves, excuse me, or the branches and the leaves of the amaranth may die back. Now, this disease, the anthracnose, it can actually cause, fung it is caused by a fungus. So it can be managed by avoiding causing any damage to the plants because this would create a wound on your plants and then this is where the pathogen is going to enter into your plant. So it's a good idea and as a lot of you may know, especially when the plant is young, the stem of it can be very soft because it is mostly water. So you want to avoid damaging the plant to reduce the risk of it getting this disease. So the next type of disease that may affect your plant is the wet root disease. And the symptoms of these of this is water soaked lesions on the stem. You may see the presence of fungal spores and this may cause the lesion to actually look hairy because of the spores. And it may also cause the leaves to fall off. It is also caused by a fungus. Now this fungus, it mainly affects plants that have been damaged by insects or by other means. Now it's spread in the hair or if the seeds that you are planted is infected. And in warmer weather, the disease, the wet rot disease is most likely to, to occur or in moist condition. Now, how can you control the wet rot disease? One, it is good, a good idea to grow only disease resistant variety. You want to treat disease with copper fungicides and don't plant colorlo densely, densely. And make sure that when you're planting it, you're using certified seeds. If you do that, then it will help to control the wet rot disease. Dumping off, which most gardeners are familiar with, is another thing that can affect your callaloo. And so the symptoms would be poor germination or the seedlings may fall over. You may see brownish black lesions on the stem close to the soil. Now, it is also caused by a fungus which attacks seeds and seedlings when the soil is too moist. So how can you control damping off? Don't plant your seeds too deep. Don't plant it too densely either. You want to make sure that the seedlings have proper space in between them for good airflow and that will help to reduce the risk of dumping off. And also be careful not to overwater your plants because that can lead to dumping off. Now let's look at some more pests that can actually affect the amaranth plant. Now beetworm moth, is another pest that affects Kalaloo. 
It is also known as bead harmy worms, the larvae, or asparagus fern caterpillars. Now, these pe pests affect a wide range of vegetables and flowers, including members of the brassica family. It affects callaloo. It affects members of the nightshade family. And the nightshade family include things like potatoes, um, tomatoes, pepper, aubergine, stuff like that. These are members of the nightshade family. It affects beetroots. It affects asparagus, it affects beans, and a whole host of other plants. So these beet worm moths or the beet, beet harmy worms are some of the pests that affects Kalalo. Now, each female can lay between 300 and 600 eggs in their life cycle. But I made a mistake because I forgot to look up how long the females can live for so i'm gonna have to research that and put it in my video when i'm showing what these creatures look like i'm not going to be doing videos on all of these all at once i'm going to break down the videos into these individual pests that way i can give you far more information about them and show you pictures of them so that you know what to look for and especially for species that has that have a lot of different pests that have a lot of different species. Yes, yeah, so as I was saying, the female can lay up to between 300 and 600 eggs in the life cycle. Now they lay in clusters of about 50 to 150 eggs. Now these eggs can be found on the underside of the leaves or near to the blossoms or the tip of the branches. Oh, hi, Melanie. Yes, yeah, so they can be found on the underside of the leaves or close to the blossoms of your plants or on the tip of your plants. So the eggs tend to be greenish to a whitish color and it is sorry it is covered with a layer of whitish scales which tend to make the heads look a bit fuzzy like more like cotton balls now it takes two to three days if the time is warm enough for these eggs to hatch so you can just imagine if they're laying 50 eggs in a cluster 50 to 150 eggs in a cluster, and if it only takes three days for them to hatch, you can just imagine how many of these pests you can end up with in no time, which is why it is such a good idea to always be monitoring our garden because we never really know, right, when we're going to have these pests. And when we look at our plants and if we see anything that looks out of place, it's always a good idea to try to investigate. Don't just pass it on as if maybe okay maybe the time is too hot or maybe it needs a little water it's a good idea to always be monitoring our plants looking on the leaves looking on the underside of the leaves just to make sure that in case we end up with unwanted pests then we can get on it right away because it doesn't really take long for these creatures to develop a large population and then it would be difficult to get them under control so Yes, pay close attention to your plants. It's a lot of work though. Yes, it is definitely a lot of work paying attention to our plants, but it is well worth it, especially when we do find that we have pests because we can get them under control and save our plants. Okay, so the larvae goes through five instars or stages. Now these take roughly 11 days sometimes it can take more for these five instars to be completed that depends on the weather so the cooler the weather the longer it takes for the larvae to complete its cycle the larvae tend to be pale green or yellow in the first two stages 
It has pale stripes in the third stage or the third instar. Then in the fourth stage, it gets darker, dark solid. And then in the fifth stage, it tends to get green with pink or yellow color and a white stripe that goes laterally along the body. The pupal stage of these beet harmy worms, they take place in the soil and it lasts for seven, sorry, six to eight days if the weather is warm enough. Now, what damage do these bead harmyworms cause? The larvae will feed on the foliage and on the fruits of your plants. The young larvae, they will actually leave just a skeleton of the foliage that was on your plants, whereas the older larvae tend to leave large, irregularly shaped holes in the foliage. So treatment of these include things like soapy water. So you hand pick them and put them in soapy water or you can spray them with soapy water or you can use spinosad or you can use BT as a Y. I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. <laughs> yes, so that's BT and as a Y is spelled A-Z-A-I-W-I. So that is what works on these beet harmy worms. Okay, so another pest, which is very commonly known, that affects your amaranth or your callaloo is aphids. Yes, those little buggers seem to affect everything. <laughs> Okay, you do that a lot, Melanie. You check at least three times a day. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, I wish I had that kind of time, but I, yeah, sometimes I try to check it daily, but there are times when I can only check portions of the garden per day. So, yeah, but that's good that you're able to check at least three times a day and always get lucky finding bugs and eggs to squish. <laughs> Yeah, it's good that you're able to find them before they wreak havoc on your garden. Yeah, so aphids. These little guys always seem to find their way onto our plants. So because most of you guys are familiar with aphids and most of you may be familiar with how to treat them, so we're not really going to be going much into the discussion about aphids of course you may know that there are many many different species of aphids uh oh <laughs> it sounds as if my husband decides to turn up his theta system so if you hear a lot of noise i apologize yeah so for just in case there are those of you on here who may I encounter aphids for the first time and don't really know how to treat it. So I'm just going to tell you a few of the methods that you can use to get these aphids under control. So neem oil, you can make a neem oil solution, whether just neem oil with a bit, a few drops of soap and water, or you can mix in some baking soda in there, but you don't want to use a lot of baking soda. You can use predators so predators would include things like ladybugs or lace wigs the green lace wigs these are very good predators for the aphids you can also make solutions using peppermint or rosemary and thyme you can also use diatomaceous earth but then i learned last week that some gardeners have used diatomaceous earth and they still see aphids. I don't know whether or not it is the case where they had that many aphids. Maybe some of the aphids did not actually 
appear yet. So I don't know if it is new aphids they're seeing or if it is the old ones that they treated because usually if you put diatomaceous earth on them, the diatomaceous earth would cut their exoskeleton and eventually lead to their death. But you never know, anything is possible. But anyway, diatomaceous earth do work from time to time. It should work all the time. Let's see, and why it says, I check throughout the day if I am not at work. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, now the next type of pest is leaf miners. These guys are the difficult ones to deal with. They are similar to dealing with the amaranth weevil or at least the larvae of the amaranth weevil because they tend to bury themselves inside of the plant. Now, when they are inside of the plant, it's difficult to reach them with the pesticide. So it can be difficult to treat them, which is another reason why it is so important to try to find these pests as quickly as possible. Okay, you hate them. <laughs> yes, I know. You see, you had a long running with them, with some of your plants. Thankfully, you were able to get them under control, though. Yes, these leaf miners, there are actually many different insects that, lay, that cause leaf miners. So I'm going to be putting that in a video as well so that you can know what to look out for. Yes, so these leaf miners, they live in the in the leaves and so it is a good idea to inspect your plants regularly because the moths or other insects that cause leaf miners they are the ones you're going to have to try to get under control because they are the ones that are going to be laying the eggs that is going to be causing the leaf miners so when you see creatures flying around your plants that you are not familiar with it is a good idea if you can get pictures of it and or at least observe how it looks so that you can research it and find out what it is if it is a pest if it is a predator or if it is okay for it to be around your plants because prevention is always better than cure sometimes the cure can be really difficult to come by so neem oil work on these leaf miners, provided you can get to them before they burrow deep into your leaves. Now, like I said before, it's best to inspect your plants regularly. So spinosad is another method that you can use to control the leaf miners, or you can use a hot pepper spray to control them. So if you find that you are having issues with leaf miners, a good suggestion or a good idea would be to remove the leaves that are damaged. If the larvae or the leaf miners is already inside the leaves, it's a good idea to get rid of that leaf and destroy it because it's not real. The treatment will not get into the leaves in order to get rid of them. So it's a good idea to get rid of the leaves and destroy it with the leaf miners in there because what you don't want is to be treating the plants for leaf miners or for the insects that cause leaf miners. And then these leaf miners that are already in the leaves are gonna be staying there till, till, they, reach un until they reach the maturity state, right? So you want to get them under control as early as possible. So these are some of the pests and some of the diseases that are most common in affecting the amaranth plant. So have any of you ever had issues with any of these on your amaranth plant? I know a lot of you may not grow amaranth guys not like not a lot of people do grow amaranth although it is getting more and more popular these days 
And then there are so many different varieties of the Hammerant family. I didn't even have a clue that there were so many different species of it until recently. But, and I didn't even know because I've seen a lot of the species. I've known that they look like Amaranth, but I didn't know they were actually Amaranth. So I've seen a lot of them, didn't even know that they were even edible. That is why one of the reasons why I so love YouTube because you get to learn so many different things. Okay, you've had the fungus and the aphids. Yes. So far, I've been fortunate with my color. The only, the only um, pest I've had to deal with since I started growing it here is the aphids. So I'm pretty thankful for that because I was able to use the diatomaceous earth to get them under control. But I have seen the, um, I don't know if I've seen the weevil, the amaranth worm weevil, but I have seen the damage that they cause to colorless plants because I've seen that type of damage on some colorless plants in Jamaica, but I did not really realize until now that that's what is actually causing it let's see russell says the problem with spinal sod it should not be used on flowering plant as the active ingredients harm bees yes so true yes so one has to be very careful if we're using it and then there are those who grow amaranth to harvest the leaves and then there are those who grow amaranth for the seeds because the seeds is the seeds are very nutritional and so is the stem and the leaves of the color loop so people grow it for various reasons so yes it's a good idea like you said russell to be careful when using the spinal sod yeah so i didn't even I've grown so many colorless in my lifetime, but I never really gave them thought to the seed being edible. But now that I know that people actually grow it just for the seeds, then I think I'm going to allow a few of my plants to actually fully go into seeding. I would like to know what the seeds taste like, what I can use it on if I can. Well, it is said that it is using smoothie and some other ways, so will be interesting definitely going to allow some of my plants to go into seeding so i'm going to be doing a video on amaranth the plant itself and i'm going to be discussing a lot about it so in the live here we look at some of the pests that affect it but in the video i'm going to be looking at why it's a good idea to grow it i'm not really going to go much into details at the moment but yes so that is one of the upcoming videos that you can look forward to. Okay, so what have you guys been up to these days? How is your garden coming on? I was doing a video on just to give you guys a tour of my garden. But it was take, the video was so long. I wanted to show you that video yesterday, but the video was so long that my phone started to overheat because I was recording with, I was recording with the phone and it shut down while I was recording saying that the phone is overheating. I don't think, I don't really think it was the, the, the video that is causing it to overheat, but I think maybe something is wrong with the phone. So I might have to go back and draw out my camera again. It's so easy to just record with the phone, but well, let's see. Rodney says, have you ever foraged for amaranth? No, I have never foraged for amaranth. Well, when I was younger, when I was growing up, because I'm asthmatic and some, I don't know if it is all species, but there's a particular species of the amaranth that they say is pretty good for asthma. So you would use it to boil a tea. And it is one that has green leaves. So it would look similar to 
the ones that I grow in my garden, but then the leaves are green and the stems are red. So that one, although there could be many varieties that looks like that, that look like that. Yes, but that one they say is good for asthma. It grows wild. So that, yes, yeah, so that one um, I've actually gone in search of or forage for, but you don't really have to go far to find it in Jamaica because, because sometimes it just grow by the roadside. Yes, but um, to forage for it per se, no, I've never really. Yeah, I've never really done that. Okay. Let's see what have white says. I'm back teaching face to face on my garden misses me, I think. I do attend to it in the evenings. Yeah. Naturally, it is going to miss you, all that loving attention that you always give to it. It's definitely going to be missing you. <laughs> Let's see. I think I press a button here. That's causing some issues on my screen. How do I minimize this thing? I don't know what I did wrong here. Anyway, it's okay. I can still see what you guys are saying. So that's okay. Do you know the color of the seeds? Um, I think it's black. Yeah, I think it's black. I know a lot of them has red seeds. I've seen the red leaves. And I've seen the red and green leaves. Well, in pictures, I've seen the red and green leaves. But I didn't know that they actually have some of them producing red seeds. Interesting. I was very surprised when I came across quite a few images of them having red seeds. Should be interesting. I would love to get my hand on that variety. Do you guys have access to that variety? Yeah, I've never really grown that one. Let's see. I missed anything here. Okay, I didn't miss anything. Yeah, so I'm going to be working on those videos. Um, guys, if you see me missing out on my regular uploads don't feel too bad <laughs> i'm still going to be giving you your videos but i might be doing a bit less videos for a while because i injured my hand so i cannot write <laughs> at least i can use my right hand to write but to do research and do writing is a bit of a challenge for me right now. So if you see that I'm slowing down or not giving you much information in my life as I used to, it's because I injured my hand. So for a while, I won't be able to do as much with my hand as I should be able to. But I'm still going to keep you guys informed with my videos and lives. You guys are pretty quiet. I don't know what my kids are up to. Sound as if they are bouncing things around. Yeah, so what kind of pest are you guys dealing with now? Um, are you getting your pest under control? Or are you enjoying a pest-free gardening season? Or garden season? Well, uh, <laughs> I can't even talk. Lord. 
Yeah. I was going through my garden the other day when I was harvesting my um no, I wasn't harvesting. I was what was I doing? Oh, transplanting some kale. And while I was transplanting my kale, I noticed I am starting to see those cabbage moths flying around. And man, did I ever see the fattest set of cabbage worms I've ever seen. They were so big, they were about inch and a quarter long, and they were about three sixteenth of an inch fat. Usually I would see them maybe about a sixteenth of an inch thick and maybe about three quarters of an inch long, but they were so big and they were so well camouflaged in the stem of the plant that I didn't, I was wondering maybe what's happening to my plant? Why is it growing irregular? But then I decided to squeeze down on it to see what it is, how it feels and realize that it was actually the cabbage worms. So now I'm going to have to treat those because I don't really have a lot of the brassicas this year. And now that I found them, I realized that they were the ones that are causing my little pak choy, pak choy not to do well. So I'm going to have to deal with them pretty quickly. Let's see. You're, you, okay, hope your hand gets better. One thing for long worms on tomatoes. As I type, okay. <laughs> yeah, I've never really seen the long worms. I'm going to have to look them up to see what they are like. Are they the same as the tomato orange worms? Yeah. Well, this year I can't really complain. My garden is not doing too badly where pests are con a concern. Uh, apart from birds, those birds, those mud pies, they're destroying my strawberries. I can't seem to harvest any strawberries because they're just all over in there unfortunately i have other things planted with the strawberries and some of these things grow pretty these plants grow pretty tall so creating a mesh around it is not really ideal so i don't really know what i'm going to do to protect the strawberries but i need to find some way to get these birds I wish there were some trap I could set for them that would affect them but not affect the other birds because these magpies are getting so plentiful and they are so annoying. But anyway, hopefully I'll be able to oops, hopefully I'll be able to get them under control. I'm gonna to have to research how to get them under control without affecting the rest of birds. Okay, yes, it is a Orn worms. Okay. No, not your bad. I um, they're called by many names, so I just wanted to make sure. Anyway, guys, um gonna be saying bye for now. Because I need to go grab me some food. <laughs> yeah, I need to go get me some dinner. So I'm going to say it bye to you and hopefully I will see you on today's what? Monday? Monday? Gardening? Yes, Monday. Yeah, so I'll see you guys on Friday. Hopefully between now and Friday I can provide you with videos of those pests that I mentioned that affect the color loop. Okay, so you have the banana peppers. Some are mild, some are hot. They should all be mild. Okay, so did you plant them close to other hot peppers? Because peppers cross pollinate. So if you plant them with hot peppers, they're going to cross pollinate and you're going to end up with some of them being hot. And sometimes it might not be that you planted them close to hot peppers. It could be that wherever you got your seeds from, whoever produced that crop, they planted it with hot pepper and so the cross-pollination occurred before you actually 
got the seeds but yes if you plant peppers beside others they will cross pollinate okay no hot pepper planted which means that previous farmers planted them with hot pepper so you ended up <laughs> so you ended up with some of them being hot i'm sorry they didn't turn out the way you want them though so what you should do then russell is try to save the ones that are mild and then see if you can grow those seeds maybe then you will end up with them not being hot oh hi macbejan thank you yeah all right good night han white have a good night rest and stay safe out there hi makiahe yeah so i'm gonna say goodbye to you guys and hope you have a wonderful night or a wonderful evening and hope to see you again on friday so take care now